ki jai. Material world reminders, ki jai. It's the interesting thing about this place is that it's not supposed to let us forget that um, this is not really where we want to be. This is not actually our final destination. Uh, but along the way, we have we have wonderful jewels like the days of Ekadashi and the association of devotees that give us hope that even though this is not our final destination, uh, the true destination is coming. And, and we are on the right path. We're headed toward the best place possible, kind of at warp speed. So thankfully, we, we get kind of like a, a bonus fast forward day uh, and, and we can take full advantage of it. So thank you. It's always such a wonderful, wonderful pleasure to be with all of you. Happy Agadashi. Om Agyanate Mirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Dasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashtate Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivas Adigaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpatarupyascha Kripa Sindhu Pyevacha Patitanam Pavanepyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha So today is a very special Ikadashi. I'm not sure which Ikadashi I can ever say. You know, this one's not so special. All of them are incredibly special. Um, but this one happens to be pretty amazingly special. What I love about Bhakti is there is a festival for everything. Festival for any and every reason. Um, and so, many times, Lord Vishnu and the Devas, or the Celestials in the Heavens, who are controlling planetary affairs and material elements and so on and so forth, um, they get tired, as, as living entities are wont to do, and they decide that it is time for them to take a well-deserved nap. Just as all of us need rest, um, they all decide to take some rest. And this is what happens during the four months of Chaturmas, which are coming up. And so this Ekadashi marks that time when all of the devas, including Lord Vishnu, are gathering together, deciding, you know what? Now would be a really good time for everyone to just power down. Um, and so all of the functions of the universe, because the natural question arises, well, then what happens to the rest of the universe? If all of the devas are asleep, if Lord Vishnu is asleep, then what happens? Is there no maintenance? Is there anything happening? Um, and there is one personality who does stay awake while everyone else sleeps and they watch over the whole entire creation. And that living entity is Lord Shiva. And so Lord Shiva takes the thankless task of staying around for all of us, making sure that everything still continues to run smoothly while everyone else takes some, some rest. So this is Deva Shayana Ekadashi, um, also known as Padma Ekadashi, also known as Shayan Ekadashi, also known as Ashadi Ekadashi, because it comes during the month of Ashad. And that month started um, two weeks ago on the last Ekadashi. Now we're coming towards the full moon. So this is the Ekadashi in the light fortnight of the month of Ashad. So it's also known as Ashadi Ekadashi. Um, it is a very, very special Ikadashi uh, throughout Maharashtra. It is very dear to a saint named Tukaram. And there are many, many, many people, devotees, who have gone out on so many different pilgrimages and sankirtans, chanting the holy names of God. And so then they come back from their pilgrimages ready to worship the Lord anew. Um, 
which is a whole history unto itself. But we only have such a small amount of time. So let's see, we'll see what we can combine with, uh, with the, the story and the glories of this particular Ekadashi. Last Ekadashi, one person was asking a question. We know that Ekadashi benefits us, but does it actually please Krishna? And then how do we know that it pleases Krishna? Um, and the answer came from Garga Samhita, which is a wonderful treatise by Garga Muni, who, if any of us have read Krishna book or have delved into the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we will remember that Garga Muni was the family priest for Vasudev. And Vasudev sends Garga Muni to perform the birthright ceremonies, name giving ceremonies, all of the early rituals for Krishna and Balaram while they were staying with Nanda Maharaj. So Garga Muni has compiled this Garga Samhita with so many of the pastimes and details and wonderful fun facts uh, that go along with Krishna's pastimes. And within this Garga Samhita, the gopis go and they ask Srimati Radharani. So you've seen something that is incredibly astonishing. Everyone in the universe is running after Krishna. And Krishna is running after you. How did you do it? Tell us something. There must have been like some kind of like secret incantation. Did you did you sprinkle something secretly in his food? Like, what did you do? What happened? How is this possible that this one personality was captured? The hearts of everyone in the entire creation is wrapped around your finger, like a subservient just a menial servant. Srimati Radharani shyly, confidentially replies that it is because of fasting on Ekadashi, which happens to be the favorite day of Lord Vishnu, that anyone is able to bring Krishna under their control. And she tells the gopis this, saying anyone, meaning that it is possible even for living entities like you and I, a simple fast, this simple act of taking up some tapasya endears us to the heart of the Lord so much. He says, that's it. You've purchased me. That's all I've ever needed, which is incredible. Um, sometimes we think, you know, this is really, this is just going to be available to anyone, everyone. Sh shouldn't there be a lock? On, on the people who can purchase the Supreme Lord. Uh, but that's what's wonderful about our unlimited Lord is that over and over again, he is Akila Rasamrita Murti. He's able to fulfill the desires. He's able to interact and reciprocate with every living entity that is yearning with any tinge of a desire to purchase him. And still, that doesn't lessen his ability to reciprocate with anyone else. He's able to give 100% to everyone and still have 100%. It's the inconceivable nature of Krishna. So this is the glory of a simple action like fasting on a Kadashi. And I say simple because it is simple. The concept is quite simple. The execution may not be easy. But if we think about all of the things that we do for love in this, in this material world, um, there are so many days people will stay up all night talking to loved ones. You kind of forget about food, you forget about sleep, you forget about responsibilities. And sometimes people around you are a little bit upset about that, but still it happens. And then everybody says, oh, you know, it happens. That's love. And then we get to our relationship with the Supreme Person. And all of that goes out the window. We, we seem to forget all of the things that, oh, that's just love. Um, are we ready for that kind of loving relationship? 
are we are we even intrigued by it? Because even just when our, our curiosity is piqued, that's enough for Krishna. Krishna will reciprocate even with that, even with the desire to want that desire. It all winds up being enough for Krishna. And that is such an encouraging point for me. Because here the emphasis isn't all on, you've got to get it all right. And this is the only, like there's only one path to getting it all right. With Krishna, it's like there are innumerable paths to getting it right. As long as we are jumping in with our whole hearts, trying to always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. So this Akadashi day is as simple as that trying to weed out all of the other distractions just for one day every two weeks trying to cast aside all of the other anxieties that might be in the mind and in the heart and just trying to focus with love and affection on our relationship with divinity and ekadashi is so wonderful so prominent, so potent, that even if there are anxieties, the, the solution is simple. Simply pray about them on Ekadashi. Give them to Ekadashi Devi. She is so incredibly merciful, so incredibly compassionate. So we'll hear about the glories of this particular Ekadashi. The story <clears throat> of the Sikadashi is as follows, taken from Garga Samhita. Once, Maharaj Yudhishthir said, O Keshava, what is the name of the Akadashi that occurs during the waxing moon in the month of June, July? Who is the worshipable deity for this sacred day? And what are the rules and regulations for observing this Akadashi? Please explain these details to me. Lord Krishna replied, O maintainer of this world, Sri Narada Muni once asked this very same question to Lord Brahma. Now please hear from me the wonderful history which Lord Brahma narrated to Narada Muni in his reply. Once, the great orator and best of the sages, Narada, said to Lord Brahma, O father, what is the name of the Akadashi that occurs during the waxing moon in the month of Asha? Kindly explain how I should observe this Ekadashi in order to please the Supreme Lord. So here once again we hear, not only for our benefit, but this brings joy to the heart of our beloved Lord. Lord Brahma replied, There is no other vow in this material world which is as sacred as the vow of Ekadashi. It is extremely necessary for one to observe the vow of Ekadashi in order to nullify all his sinful reactions. A person who does not observe Ekadashi in this world certainly goes to hell. The Ekadashi that occurs during the waxing moon in the month of June-July is called Devashayana or Padma Ekadashi. In order to please the Supreme Lord Rishikesh, one should follow this Ekadashi. It is stated in the Puranas that there was a saintly emperor named Mandata who ruled the entire world. He was born in the dynasty of the sun god, was extremely powerful, and always stood up for the truth. So he was within the dynasty of Lord Ram. So already, he's, he's got several good things going for him. This king maintained his subjects piously and affectionately as if they were his own children. In this pious king's kingdom there was no famine, drought, or any kind of disease. All his subjects lived peacefully without any anxiety, and they were very prosperous. There was no wealth in the treasury of the king which was unlawfully earned. In this way the king and his subjects happily spent their days. After many years, however, due to providence and some sinful activities, there was no rainfall in his kingdom for three consecutive years. As a result, people became afflicted with hunger due to lack of food and became full of anxiety. As a result of suffering from lack of food, 
the performance of various sacrifices, and the study of the Vedas came to a standstill. Then all the subjects came before the king and appealed. O king, please hear our words, which will ultimately benefit us. The water is addressed in the scripture as Nara. The Supreme Lord resides in Ayana. Therefore, another name of the Supreme Lord is Narayan. The Supreme Lord Vishnu is all-pervading in his form as clouds. He alone causes the rainfall. The food grains are produced from rain and the living entities subsist on grains. At present, due to lack of these food grains, your subjects are suffering and decreasing. O best of kings, please find some remedy for our miserable condition and restore peace and prosperity among us. The king replied, Whatever you have said is true. The food grains are considered like Brahman. Everything is sustained by food grains. The living entities of the entire world subsist on food grains. It is clearly stated in the Puranas and other scriptures that due to the sinful activities committed by the king, he and his subjects suffer. Although I cannot ascertain my fault through my own consideration and intelligence, I will nevertheless try my best for the benefit of my subjects. Now how incredible is this King Mandata? Where would we think to see a ruler that would see <coughs> natural disasters that we have now put the title as like acts of God, right? Where would we see a ruler taking full accountability and responsibility for it, thinking there must have been some sinful activity committed on my part? And even though I can't even find anything that I might have done, let me go and ask someone else. This amount of accountability is astounding. This to me is what differentiates Vedic times from the modern times. It's not that there was a lack of famine or drought or pestilence or disease or any of these things. Actually, we see they were always happening. The difference is how they were handled by the living entities of the time. So now let's journey with King Mandata and see what he does after taking such incredible responsibility. That in itself is applaudable. After speaking in this way, King Mandata gathered some of his principal armies, and after offering obeisances to Lord Brahma, he entered the forest. Within the forest, he regularly visited the ashrams of great sages and ascetics. While wandering in the forest in this way, one day, by providence, the king met the great sage Angira, the son of Lord Brahma. Sage Angira was as effulgent as Lord Brahma himself and his effulgence illuminated Lord Brahma in all the four directions. As soon as the self-controlled king saw him, he immediately got down from his carrier and offered his respectful obeisances at the feet of the sage. Then the king folded his hands and offered prayers. The sage reciprocated by blessing the king. Thereafter, the sage inquired from the king about the cause of his arrival and the well-being of his kingdom. The king replied, O Lord, I have been ruling my kingdom according to religious principles, but there has been no rainfall in my kingdom for the last three years. As a result, my subjects are suffering from various miseries, and I have not been able to ascertain its cause in order to remove this cause. Today I have come to your lotus feet. Kindly tell me how my subjects can live peacefully and thus attain auspiciousness. The sage Angira replied, O king, the present age of Satya Yuga is the best of all Yugas. In this Yuga, people worship the Supreme Brahman. The fourfold religious principle is manifest in this Yuga. No one except the Brahmanas is supposed to perform austerities in this Yuga. In spite of this standard, a Shudra in your kingdom is undergoing austerity. As a result of this unlawful conduct, you are facing its consequences in the form of drought. Therefore, you should try to kill him and bring peace and prosperity into your kingdom. Okay, whoa. Um, this brings to mind just how many people thought that Srila Prabhupada should not be preaching this 
advanced philosophy all over the world, right? So earlier question is, should everybody really have the right to perform ekadashi? Like the benefits are so immeasurable. Do you just put this in the hands of anyone? And so in Satya Yuga, there really was kind of a lock on just what kind of austerities could be performed. Question would be, why? What, why? Why put a hold on austerity? It seemed like everybody should be able to do some kind of austerity. However, um, we have not been living with problem demons, the likes of which are, are you know, famous names like Ravan, Hiranyakashipu, Hiranyaksha. So many of these huge, big and bad demons, they got their powers that they use to then torment the rest of the universe by performing austerities. So austerities brings immense power. And if we learn anything from Spider-Man and any kind of superhero, it's with great power comes great responsibility. So they don't want to just put this austerity in the hands of anyone. Srila Prabhupada was such a visionary. He was so intent on imbibing the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Nityananda Prabhu that despite any and all misgivings, he understood this is not Satya Yuga where there should be a lock on who can purchase this, the heart of the Supreme Lord. The wonderful thing about Kali Yuga is that no one is qualified. And because no one is qualified, everyone should be given the chance to try and become qualified. And so with a heart filled with immeasurable compassion, the likes of which I cannot even begin to fathom, a 70-year-old man went and defied all the, all the odds. Every single odd. We should not, technically, if we were in a previous age, we would not be allowed to have this wonderful opportunity to gather together on this wonderful day of Ekadashi, discuss with each other, and gain so much merit just by hearing and remembering these pastimes. By hearing about and remembering the great saints that have walked this path of bhakti yoga, this path of loving devotional service. We shouldn't have this opportunity, and yet we do. It helps me to become so incredibly grateful for this opportunity that maybe in a previous age, I wouldn't have had at all. My, my religious advancement would have been dependent on the higher echelons of society. I would have just had to wait for it to trickle down the mercy and, and hope that it gets to me. Here Srila Prabhupada has chased us all down. Nityananda Prabhu is chasing people down. Please just, whatever you do, take this holy name, begging them. Begging all of us to take advantage of things that we don't even realize the privilege that we have. So, um, apparently, when you transgress those rules of society and you are a shudra who is going to perform austerity within Satya Yuga that could have been punishable by death, which, you know, seems very strong and harsh, but then again also just makes me think for a moment about the privilege of being in Kali Yuga. Millions of faults in this age but then the Lord becomes so extremely compassionate. The devotees become extremely compassionate. The standard is lowered way down. The bar is so low. It's almost as if it's like, it, God has made it impossible for us to fail and still we'll focus on trying to find ways to do so. We will, we will focus on ways to try and like dodge the mercy as if we were in an endless game of spiritual dodgeball and we are winning, but really we're losing. So let's see what King Mandata has to say about this death penalty that an unknown person has been given. 
The king said, O oh, great sage, it will be impossible for me to kill an innocent person who is engaged in performing austerity. Therefore, please instruct me about some easy solution. Thank God for, for easy solutions. The sage replied, O oh, king, if this is the case, then simply observe the sacred ikadashi known as Padma, or Deva Shaini, which occurs during the waxing moon in the month of June, July. By the influence of this vow, there will certainly be rainfall in your kingdom. This ikadashi awards one all auspiciousness and perfection. It destroys all obstacles on the path of perfection. O king, you along with your subjects should observe this ikadashi. After hearing these assuring words of the great sage, the king offered his obeisances and returned to his palace. Thereafter, in the month of Ashad, or June, July, the king, along with his family members and subjects, properly observed this auspicious Padma, or Shayana Ekadashi. By the influence of this observance, the rain poured down all over his kingdom. There was no more scarcity of water, and soon the entire world became filled with foods, grains, and by the mercy of the Lord Rishikesh, everyone lived happily. Therefore, it is the duty of everyone to observe this sacred Ikadashi, which awards everyone happiness and liberation. Hearing and reading the glories of this Ikadashi destroy all one's sinful reactions. This Ikadashi is also known as Vishnu Shayana Ikadashi. In order to please Lord Vishnu, the devotees observe this Ikadashi with special devotion. They do not endeavor for material enjoyments or liberation. Rather, they pray for pure devotional service to the Lord. The famous vow of Chaturmasya begins from this Ikadashi. The devotees observe the vow of Chaturmasya by hearing and chanting the topics of the Lord for four months, beginning from the day when Lord Hari goes to bed up to the time when he wakes up. So soon, uh, the Lord will be sleeping, depending upon which sampradaya or which path and lineage of tradition that you follow. Within our ISKCON tradition, we usually go from full moon to full moon with our months. Um, and so even though the Sakadashi marks that day, there are still like a few days that we wind down sing the Lord a little lullaby for the next few days. And on the on the Purnima, which I think is July 3rd, we will begin this Chaturmas, which for four months, can we dedicate ourselves to just hearing a little more, chanting a little more, thinking a little more. And by a little, I really mean a little. So if you heard a pastime the day before, just Listen to one more minute the next day and increase those minutes as the months go on and see where you get at the end of those four months, at the end of Kartik, we can all see where we've journeyed with one another. This year, um, this Chaturmas is going to be extremely special. In the solar calendar, we have a leap day at the end of February. Right? We call it leap year, but there's just, it's just one extra day. Um, within the Vedic calendar, they also have to balance out the movements of the moon to make the, the years work smoothly. Um, however, they have a leap month. It's a whole extra month added, which is called Purushottam Adikmas, which means Purushottam, the extra month. Um, and this month will be coming kind of in the middle of the first month of Chaturmas. So if this makes any, any sense, like think about it, if we were going like January, February, January 2.5, like, like 2.0, then you have the rest of February, and then you go on through March. So I know, it gets, it gets a little bit fuzzy. It's like, what's gonna happen? Yeah, we're just gonna have more, more month. Um, but the, the thing about this Purushottam Mas is that every single holy day is present within that month. All of the auspiciousness that you can get during any and every single holy day 
is present every day within that month. So if we are thinking about going on a journey and just increasing our hearing and chanting just a little, this is definitely the year to do so. It only comes around every two and a half to three years, this leap month. Um, and it is, for me at least, always a cause for great celebration because there is so much spiritual merit to be gained. And that makes me happy because this material world is not a happy place. And any, any chance that I can get to accumulate more of this joy, I want. So not only do we have this wonderful Ekadashi, but we have a whole month coming up. And within that month, there are two Ekadashis that don't come around every year because it only happens during Purusha Dhammas. So I'm sure we'll be talking about those as those come around. We'll be diving in and trying to see the glories of the month of Purusha why it is named this month, what happened during this month, what's going on with the whole thing. So we will we'll get to that. Um, during the Akadashis of those month, at, at that month, woo, which is coming kind of in the middle of July. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be journeying together. It'll be cause for extra celebration, more blessings, more mercy. And we think like, really? We can have more blessings and more? Absolutely, because our Lord is that unlimited. But all glories to King Mandata, who was not willing to simply take this death penalty is the answer. The amazing thing about this king is he was never willing to just save himself. There was a drought in the kingdom for three years. He could have just said, well, I'm fine. Like, I have an endless treasury. It'll be fine for me. I don't know about the rest of you. Instead, he took full responsibility for it, thinking this must be some sinful deed of mine going, traveling through the forest to meet different sages, to meet different spiritualists, to ask, do you have any idea what could be going on? And then when he found out what was going on, he was not willing to simply sacrifice an innocent person. He wanted some way that everyone could benefit. These are the hearts of devotees looking for ways that everyone can benefit. I was thinking about another drought that I was reading about yesterday. Um, there was a drought, and at that time, there it caused like a big famine. It caused a huge issue in Bengal. And the person who jumped in, like a sort of like universal Red Cross, but better, was Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda and a devotee named Udaranda, they both jumped in. And regardless of caste or creed or nationality, if they were in trouble, Lord Nityananda helped them. Giving them not just material help, but love for Krishna and the holy name, all three at the same time. Material help, Krishna Prema and Krishna Nam all together. This is the mercy of our Vaishnavas. This is the the blessing of Kali Yuga. Where else would we see that the absolute most downtrodden, the Lord goes running to those people. Absolutely running to those people. And it is not just a Vedic principle. Right? So many different so many different spiritual paths we see this act of god running to the downtrodden and let's face it all of us at some point are going to be downtrodden and so i am trying to remind myself that when i feel the most downtrodden it means i'm in the most excellent position for a downpour of mercy Big obstacles means there has to be a big miracle coming. And many times I never know how it's going to work out because it's not my plan, it's God's plan. And I'm trying to remind myself, but if I stick with it, if I somehow maintain the faith that it is true, that my Lord is no running to help me, no 
Low battery. It's a low battery, but it's fine. That my Lord is running to help me. That absolutely with those big obstacles comes even bigger mercy. We've seen it in Vedic tradition. We've seen it in Christian traditions. We've seen it in, in Islamic traditions. Everywhere we look where people are really and truly worshiping God with all of their hearts, somehow the Lord doesn't leave them stranded. Even though we'll see incredible, incredibly horrible things that will happen in this material world. We'll see it. Um, if we had a chance to speak to the people, usually they never feel abandoned by God. Even though they are going through some of the harshest things, those people who have such devotion never ever feel abandoned by the Supreme Lord. King Mandata was not willing to abandon even one subject. And he was just a king. What to speak of the king of the entire universe? The Supreme Lord is not willing to abandon even one of us. This is the blessing of Ekadashi. The Lord is not willing to abandon anyone. And so from his own body emerges a beautiful warrior princess who becomes known as Ekadashi. And he asks, O oh Devi, what can I do for you? How can I, how can I bless you? The only boon she asked for was to be able to eradicate all of the anxieties, miseries, sins, fears of those people who honor her on her day. Egadashi is the lesson for all of us every two weeks that the Lord is not willing to abandon anyone. So, should everybody just be given the opportunity to perform this austerity? Yes. Because the Lord's not willing to abandon us. He's not willing to forget about, about us, no matter how many lifetimes we've forgotten about him. Deva Shaina Ekadashi ki ja. Srila Prabhupada ki ja. Compassionate Vaishnavs ki ja. Our most compassionate Lord ki ja. Thank you, Chita Gopi. Ekadashi austerity is not a burden, it's a privilege. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Beautiful point. Okay. We open in it, we're opening it up for questions, comments, angles of vision, and maybe voice cracks. Does anybody have a voice crack? I hear Adi's voice crack. Bhakti Devi, where's Bhakta Bentley? Is he under the desk? Nita Chand is here, check it out. Hare Krishna. Okay, Louise, come on now, please. Reflect. I'm gonna start going out. Okay, there he is, Bhima Prabhu. Hare Bhavachitra Kopi Prabhuji. Very nice class. I'm always in a quandary in regards to a codice. Um, because I never remember it. Uh, I don't take it seriously enough. Um, I do understand that it's more important on these days. The reason I was told by someone actually very dear to you, very, very dear to you, um, that the real importance of a codice is that we spend less time think cooking, uh, gathering and eating food and more time chanting, dancing, Chanting and dancing, less feasting, more chanting and dancing. That's what is really the important part. Not so much that we are afraid about the bad spirits and brains and stuff, but mm -hmm. that we spend more time, less time thinking about uh, our stomachs. Because back in the, and, and, and clue me in if I'm wrong, but you know, back in the old days, to prepare a meal, to gather the meal, to earn the money to get a meal, took the whole day. It was literally 50% of your day was was uh, centered around harvesting the food, preparing the food, everything from scratch. If you wanted grain, you had to husk, you had to grind. These were things that took you away from concentration on Krishna. 
So I have a question. This is real. I, I don't mean to be controversial here, but if these days of a codice are determined by the movements of the planets, and are we in agreement that the planets themselves, this universe, the movements of the stars, are all material? I mean, Vishnu breathes out mm. in one outward breath. All these come. All these come into existence, um, and then when he breathes in, we go out of existence. Are we in agreement to that? We're here. I'm here with you. Okay. All right. So the, what he brings about is the universe and, the, and us spirits. Now, excuse me, I'm not a scholar at all. I'm just a farmhand. So, um, so how can something so spiritually, um, so spiritually important uh, be subjective to the movement of material spheres? Why isn't it that every moment we shouldn't be thinking every moment, let alone every day, rising and, and falling of the sun, that these days and these calendars are material in nature, and how can something like the timing of when we actually start concentrating on Krishna have to do with days of the year or movements of the planets, when those mm. things are material? So that's my question. Huh. So that's very interesting. Um, from my understanding, the holy days are present here in the material world, but not necessarily material. It's like, I don't know if you remember, we were speaking about Prahlad Maharaj, and Prahlad Maharaj becomes Prahlad Maharaj because he happened in a previous birth. He was married to a prostitute. They got into an argument and it was an argument that lasted all night. They were so angry, nobody ate, nobody slept, nobody did anything. And that day happened to be the day of Nishringa Chaturdashi. And so in his next life, he becomes Berlad Maharaj and the beloved of Lord Nishringa Dev. Um, so it's like, how can this be Nishringa Chaturdashi if Nishringa Chaturdashi has not happened yet? Because Berlad had not happened yet. Um, and it's like, if, if this was a material date, how does this work? And so the, the appearance days, these advent days, are marked on the calendars for our benefits, but not really material. Um, there are many subjects that are spoken about within, within Bhagavad Gita, but like we see, like karma is not eternal. But kala, time, is one of those things. It's like, but how does how does time work? Well, because Krishna says kaloshmi, right? Like, how are we supposed to know that it's in this world but not exactly of this world? Because that, it is originally coming from Krishna. So this Ekadashi is a Devi, originally coming from Krishna. So if it is coming from Krishna, as all of us are also coming from Krishna, but she's coming from Krishna on a much higher energy than we are um you know it's it's like looking at us like how can we be subject to all of these things and then not be subject to all of them at the same time it's it's, it's the 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 jiva tattva gets a little bit hairy and dicey at that moment um but the the simple point is that they are present in this place but not bound by the laws of material nature and this is the, the thing about Ekadashi. Lord Vishnu and Lord Krishna, in many, many stories, he goes to visit Yamaraj. And Yamaraj is overjoyed because no one ever goes to visit him. And so when the Lord arrives there and he's visiting Yamaraj, he keeps hearing these like horrendous screamings and hollerings and crying. And he asks Yamaraj, what is that? Yamaraj says, well, those are the sounds of the living entity is gaining their punishment because that's my job. And the Lord asks, well, when does it end? And Amaraj says, well, when they've kind of burned off all of their karma, which takes a lot of time. Krishna says, isn't there any, like, shortcut? Says, no. And the, the, the question then is, like, well, who, who set up this system? And she's like, Lord, you did. You gave me my service. I'm just following orders. 
And so the Lord, with his compassionate heart, thinks I have to do something about this. And from his body springs a Kadeshi Devi. But we hear of so many different King Janak goes and he decides I will sit by the doors of the hellish planets because it is said just by even seeing a Vaishnava, one's pathway to the heavenly planets and to the spiritual abode and to Vaikuntha Loka is assured. And so he thinks I will sit here at the gates to the hellish planets for as long as it takes for all of these people to go to go to their spiritual abode. So the compassionate nature of Krishna and the devotees cannot be checked by material nature. Within Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that when Krishna sees that the devotee is trying, he orders Maya, stop, they're mine now. And so this is how we, because we're still going to be living here. We're not all immediately leaving our bodies and heading off into spiritual abodes. Like we'll still be here, even if we perfect it. But they're in this material world, but not of this material world. It reminds me of the questions that I heard that uh, early generation devotees would ask Srila Prabhupada, even about himself. Srila Prabhupada, how can we accept that Guru is perfect and that Guru is the, the purest to be accepted as good as God? That Guru is not of this material body, but you wear glasses, Srila Prabhupada. And this was like a really hard thing for them to be able to grasp. How can we accept that the Guru is perfect, but you wear glasses? But we understand, and the spiritual master is, is explaining that when they come to this place, they drive a car that is fit for this place. When you go to other countries, you're going to drive a car that might be fit for those other countries. And so when these important personalities come, and when these fasting days come here, they're going to take forms that are easy for us to understand in this material world scenario. Um, Srila Prabhupada has often said, you cannot put a timeline chronologically on Krishna's pastimes in the Vedas. They only try so that our minds don't implode, right? So that our minds don't like just crumble in on itself. So you cannot actually put a timeline on the Vedas and the Puranas. They happen cyclically, they happen on their own time, they happen in between times, they happen multiple times. So these personalities, these important days are not necessarily bound by the rules of material nature. We use them for our benefit because we are bound by the rules of material nature. But these days are not. Um, and so even if you fast on Akadashi unknowingly, still works. Even if you fast on Akadashi, you fast on Nishringa Chaturdashi before it's even a Nishringa Chaturdashi. And Prahlad Maharaj was not fasting in a mood of devotion. He was angry with the wife. And still that did not stop the Lord from sending him unlimited streams of mercy. So we should hold tight to these days because even our, as my mom would call it, causeless unwillingness to serve is not going to stop Krishna from trying to throw endless streams of mercy our way, day after day, holiday after holiday. And so then he makes it, no, you think you forget, I won't let you forget. He's going to keep reminding us. And now the question is for us, do we want to Surrender to the good times. I have a really hard time with that. Just surrendering to the joy. Like allowing the joy to do its thing. Allowing these fasting days to do its thing. Allowing the holy name to soften my heart. I was like, but, you know, let's analyze this some more. And sometimes Lord's just like, let me love you. So I think of these Akadashi days and when they come up and, and when... Either I'm ready for them, or even when I'm not ready for them, I really think that the Lord is really throwing every ounce of mercy my way. Let me love you. So I want to let him love me through all of these days that are present here, even though they don't have to be. Ekadashi Devi is present here, even though she doesn't have to be. She didn't need anything from all of us. She had no other desire, no other purpose, other than to benefit all of us. That's it. 
She didn't need saving. She didn't need any help. In fact, in many versions of the story, she appears to help Lord Vishnu. And all she asks is that we honor her. So the, the timelines are there for our small minds. Um, it is not because they are bound by the laws of material nature. I hope that really long-winded answer helped. I pray that it helped. Please, God. I will tell you one thing. Yeah, I have one thing. I was listening to the class, and uh, I was putting up some fence wire for the horses, and one of my horses got spooked by a turkey, a wild turkey, and ran through the barbed wire and um, got tangled up in her legs and then started running toward And meanwhile, before this all happened, I was like, oh, I missed the courtesy of Dan. I've already indulged in my morning... Uh, constitutional meal and I was like yeah but nothing's gonna happen to me I'll just chant Hare Krishna and I'll be okay because that's what it's all about uh, and then all of a sudden when I said that I go I wonder if there is any effect to this the horse gets wrapped up in the wire and starts running towards me ran past me like the hand of a claw circling me and wrapped me up in the wire uh, it, and so needless to say my heart uh, fell out of my uh, turn out on of your my camera. Christian, Christian. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, something's wrong with my video, but anyway, the, I was wrapped up and the horse was uh, running around me in a circle because she felt the pressure of the barbed wire on her legs. Mm. And um, I basically, <laughs> I, I felt a laughter in, deep down inside me. Saying you better watch yourself. You can't. You have to do. You have to play this game. I set this board game for you. This is what I how I can't. Luckily, she stopped. I was able to stop her before the I was cut in half. Um, it, luckily, it was just the clothes that got ripped. She did not uh, bear down enough to uh, push it through. But um, afterwards, I was walking, and then when your answer came that Krishna sets this in motion, it somehow the image of the fact that. We've come into this world by our own volition. We've decided to play this game. And Krishna says, okay, here are the rules of the game. And if you're going to play this game of life with me, you have to spin this wheel, not any other wheel. You have to follow this path. This path will lead you to spiritual prosperity. This path will lead you to me eventually if you want to keep playing a game. And so I sort of like understood that if I'm going to be engaged materially speaking in this material world mm. and that Krishna has been so graceful by uh, allowing us to give us the rules of the game one of which is as you said the most important that sort of like um, advance towards finish which is what a, co a codice is it's like rolling the right that having the chance to hit the right dice where Krishna says okay this is where you're going to leap over all your troubles and move forward. Um, so until we are absolutely pure devotees who are head over heels in love with Krishna, we have to kind of play by the rules of the game. Because obviously if we're not in love with Krishna, we're somewhat still attached to the material world. And uh, so thereby, thereby we have to uh, be bound by the rules of the material world. As I was bound by the barbed wire that almost cut me in half. So thank you very much for your uh, for your class. I, I, I'm trying to learn a, a lesson here. <laughs> Hare Krishna. I appreciate your honesty and your accountability because if that had happened to me, I'd have been like, "Oh, it was a great answer. Everything's fine. I'll see you all next <laughs> next week. <laughs> see you <all> tomorrow." <laughs> but thank you for being so candid and being so spiritually honest because that, for me, really, I material nature we all think about the you know we think about the theory that we are bound i'm like but she's got some barbed wire that i don't want to get tangled in who man i'm i'm glad everything turned out okay i'm i'm really glad that's an akadashi miracle is what that is my heart is still beating i can still feel, feel my heart beating in my chest I thought for sure I was a goner. Krishna, Krishna. <laughs>
That is, I, folks, really, that is an Akadashi miracle if I've ever heard one that happened yeah. in real time. Yeah, I did yell out Hare Krishna <laughs> when I saw that, when the wire got wrapped completely around me, 360, and she was still running. I did say Hare Krishna, and then it, somehow she slowed down to a trot, and I was able to catch her. I was like running like a person in a, in a, in a, in a uh, sack race, you know, I was popping the two legs, hopping towards <laughs> Meanwhile, I was laughing <laughs> because I was asking Krishna. I was asking Krishna, I don't need to follow these things. <laughs> these, these are devotees. Only yeah. devotees can laugh at a moment like that and really remember, oh, I see the dialogue we're having, you know, but that just the ability to turn your mind and say, okay, I, I get the message. I've heard you loud and clear. There are people who would never they would never. So that in and yeah, of itself I, I, is a victory. I only learn by punishment. <laughs> I am the fool that learns by experience. <laughs> I actually have to dare Krishna. And then he does it. He, he gives me a beat down. And then I say, oh, you are for real. <laughs> That's the reciprocation. That's all, all my advancement has been painful. If any. Hare Krishna. Hey, if you want to know if it's real, ask for a beat down. It, it, it's, it's, it's really amazing because, you know, when, when I was kind of trying to give the answer, what I really felt was there's no amount of scientific proof that you can give after a certain point. You, Bhima Prabhu, you know so much more than me and I am not it's not even humility at that point. You know, like, as a senior devotee, what scientific proof am I going to give you to say, I mean, Krishna's there, Akadashi Devi's there, all these things are there. I, there, there is no amount. At, at a certain point, the questions in our hearts go beyond needing the science of it or the logic of it. Really, the question is, but is Krishna really there? And if he is really there, is he really going to show that he's really there? And so Krishna was the only one who could answer that question for you. And immediately, somehow, on Akadashi, by saving your life, and I'm so grateful, he said, I'm here with you. Jai. There's no greater logic than a good beat down. <laughs> Thank you, Bhima Prabhu. Thank you, Shri Gopi. Thanks to everyone for participating. I'm really excited for this Akadashi. Shri Gopi, you inspired us all. Yeah, let's honor this Devi. She doesn't need anything from us. It's for our benefit that we're honoring her. And we're doing it for, in, for the sake of spiritual advancement. There's no other, we're not gaining power, we're not big demons here, we're not here to gain power or anything. We're just here to honor the Devi, she's a devotee of Krishna, and we want to make spiritual advancements. Thank you. So nicely said it, Shiva Gopi, so clearly broken up for a simple-minded person. All right, all right. It's so nice to see everybody. Amrita Kishori, are you sunbathing? Where are you? C Coney Island? <laughs> Walking. Nice, nice. Nick Tai Chang. Yeah. Nick Tai Chang, where are you? What borough? Um, I'm near Bro uh, Manhattan Bridge. Cool. Cool. You always expect Nick Tai Chang to have like a saxophone or bass guitar in your arm with that hat. <laughs> Gotta pick up the posters, Diva. I'm there, man. I can't wait to see them up. Right. These are these are posters where where that are advertising the Bhakti Center and all the yoga classes and the free yoga in the park and and Tuesday night kirtan. We thought we would uh, put cover the walls with uh, beautiful because the, the the graphics on the uh, the graphics on the uh, Bhakti Center are wonderful graphics. Um, 
done by the artists, and we thought this is a great way to cover the walls, which are a little bit drab, and, um, and also advertise to the 80 people that we, 80 new people we have almost every night at the uh, hostel. So, all glories to the artists. Thank you very much, Ms. Kananda. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Ellie Brown. Ellie Brown, how are you? Where are you? Krishna, I'm in Atlanta. Oh, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea Didi, how are you? How's the family? Hi, Krishna. Very well. I'm so happy to see Kylie and we had Nancy. We had so many of the Urban Davy uh, retreat ladies here. And Sharmila is here. Is Amelie still here? Oh, she was here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. I actually got to go to Mangarati today, and it, it was not planned. It was, I guess, an, a, a Kaddish League miracle as well. Not as big as, oh, uh, not as big as not dying, like, <laughs> being a Prabhu. But I, I just woke up from a, from a, a bad dream, which, it was like the silliest bad dream, too. I, I was dreaming that I was acting. Krishna house for my initiation and uh, and all of a sudden lots of people came in and it was too crowded and I was and I didn't recognize any of them and they were all like yeah we're here for Ani Ruda and I was like there's nobody here by that meeting that's gonna have the initiation and they had like signs and they were really like raucous and I was just like what's going on and I was like I, I, I don't understand and then that's when I woke up and then it was there was enough time from waking up from that dream to go to Mangarati. So I guess Krishna really just wanted to jostle me awake and be like, it's Kadasi, go to Mangarati, stop worrying about things, go. <laughs> nice, Andrea, nice. Yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of am I'm eager to, to find out in the future if you do meet an Aniruda. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep us informed. Yeah. Andrea, are your dogs? For Kadishi, are you making them fast? No, no they're just big, like they're little jivas and dog bodies. They don't have to fast, and they're already they're already fasting because we make them have vegan food. So they, no. they they're already doing their austerities that way. <laughs> yeah, they, so then, on the strength of your sincerity and austerities, they'll be liberated for sure. Okay, all right. It's nice. It was nice spending this morning hour with you all. Thank you very much. It should be special. Thanks to you. Always nice class. Always deep, entertaining also. All right. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. <clears throat> Ride safely. Walk safely. Swim safely. I'm going to take a short. See you again tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Jai Jai.